um, and talk through some of those structures that brought us here today. Um, but before I turn it over, I'll also introduce a couple of other folks that are on the webinar with us from the uh, workforce development team, uh, Michelle McNertney, who is our division administrator over workforce development services. Um, she really oversees the federal grant programs that come uh, into Iowa and you may have, you may recognize her name from some of the emails and, and invitations that you've received. Um, and then a couple of other folks um, in the field in my division, uh, Rane Slagle and Linda Rouse, um, both overseeing operations uh, on each side of the state in the field as well. So I know that today is going to be a little bit of a long morning, uh, but we've got a lot of great information to cover. I think one of our goals at the end of this, this session is to make sure that we have, that you guys have a great understanding of this act and some of the changes that we need to make uh, to be compliant with some of the, some of those items. But we, we really want to make sure that at the end of our time that we have uh, as much or as all of your questions answered as we can. And so there's, there's points throughout this presentation um, uh, and our presenters will kind of cover uh, some of the rules of, of this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to our great partners with Mayor and Mayor um, who are facilitating this morning and let them kick things off. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Bajorek. I am a program manager with Mayor and Mayor. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Lori Collins. I'm gonna have her introduce herself here in just a minute. Um, as Mike mentioned, we are partnering with the team at Iowa Workforce Development to, to help them with this system transformation effort. Um, we are a technical assistance firm um, based out of New Jersey and Washington, D.C. Uh, we like to say that we do our work basically at the nexus of workforce, education, and economic development. So certainly a lot of consulting around the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, helping states and local areas implement that federal law and be innovative while they do it. So um, we are excited to be with all of you today, and we've been really happy with the partnership we've had with IWD up to now. Um, I know some of you may have attended one of the face-to-face -face trainings, and if so, welcome back. <laughs> we appreciate you coming back for the summary. And if you were not um, able to attend a face-to-face, -face, we're glad that you're here with us today. Um, I know that uh, you know it's very difficult to take a four-hour face-to-face training and turn it into something that's virtual, but we've done our best to try and build in some interactivity. Um, we also are gonna build in a little break for you um, so that we can all um, step away just for a couple of minutes and come back um, and then also provide lots of time for you to ask questions um, should you have them. So uh, let me quickly turn it over to Lori so that she can say a quick hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Lynn said, I'm Lori Collins and I'm also a part of the mayor and mayor team. Um, I'm glad to be on this project and working with uh, the great folks of Iowa move this system transformation effort forward. So um, I'll be spending time with you towards the latter part of the, um, of the session today. So thanks for being here. We appreciate it. All right, thank you, Lori. Um, and you'll see a third face on this slide, that's Stacy O'Keefe. Um, and Stacy works within the Division of Workforce Investment at the U uh, U.S. Department of Labor um, Region 5, which is the, the regional office out of Chicago that covers the 10 states in the Midwest, including Iowa. Um, Stacy is a bit delayed today. Um, you know, commuting in Chicago is, is never fun. Um, so I'm not sure she'll be here in time um, to cover her slides, but otherwise Otherwise, we will cover it and she'll join us as soon as she's able. So you can go ahead and go forward, please. Okay, um, for this slide, actually, I'm going to ask my colleague, Rhiannon McRoberts, who's on the line, to talk with you a little bit about the Zoom platform that we're using for this webinar. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we're trying to make it as interactive as possible, keep you as engaged as possible. So she's gonna explain some of the features. Okay, so um, first of all, just want to let you all know that we're recording the webinar today, so you can always come back um, and view it again. So I just want you to know that. Um, and also, you know, since we all can't be in the room together, we wanted to give you some options to provide feedback. So one of the ways you can do this is 
if you look at your black menu bar where it says manage participants and you have like the head and shoulders icon, if you click on that, um, another panel should pop up on your screen and you should be able to see the names of all the people who are in this webinar. Um, and then right below everyone's names, you have some options to click yes, no. Um, if you hover over that more button, you also have like clapping, thumbs up, thumbs down. So there are some tools there um, for you to give us feedback. So um, let's try it. If you guys, um, if you've used Zoom before, if you just want to click that green yes button. Great. All right. So I see a couple people who are were able to find it. So that's good. Um, all right. And we'll also be using um, polling features on this on this webinar. So I'm going to for a couple of the slides, I'm going to have a poll pop up and we're going to ask you to answer questions and that'll help us just gauge your understanding and how how clear everything is. Um, we have everybody on mute, that's to minimize the background noise, but we're gonna pause to answer questions at designated times and at the end of the webinar. In the meantime, um, if you do have any questions, you can just type them right into the chat. Um, and you can access the chat, that's another option on your black menu bar. If you um, hit the chat button, then you, the chat panel should come up and you can type any questions in there throughout the webinar and then we'll try to get to them um, when we pause. So we're going to try that next. Okay, um, so thank you, Rhiannon. Um, if you all want to go ahead and tell us your name and the county you represent in the chat box, uh, that would be helpful. And then also if you have one burning question that you really need answered before you leave here today, you can go ahead and type that in the chat box as well. And we'll be keeping track of the questions and we'll do our best to make sure that we get to all of them uh, before we wrap up by the end of the webinar. All right, let's give folks a couple of minutes to type. I see, please talk into the microphone. I'm hoping that everyone can hear us okay. Please, uh, please let us know if you're having any trouble hearing in the chat box. Thank you. All right, any burning questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Okay. All right, well, if you think of questions while we're moving through, don't hesitate to go ahead and type them in the chat box and we will cover them. Okay, I think we can go forward. All right, so this is our agenda for our time with you today on this webinar. Um, we're just gonna cover what we're doing, why, um, and we're going to do a workforce system overview, but we are gonna keep it high level. Um, I think as Mike mentioned, this is a summary session. Um, there certainly is no way to, to go into the depth um, and the coverage of the content that we could in a face-to-face. -face. Um, so, but we will do our best to cover and hit the key principles, um, key pieces of content and answer any questions you have. Um, and then Lori will cover the uh, primary roles and responsibilities of chief elected officials. And then we'll have time for questions and answers and next steps. Okay, all right, so objectives for today. We wanna to provide you with a recap of the key content that was delivered at those face-to-face -face trainings in September and October. Um, there were six and they were held around the state. Um, we want to try and build your understanding of your role as a chief elected official in the workforce system. Also introduce key action steps that chief elected officials um, will need to take to develop their local governance structure for the workforce system in Iowa. And then we want to try and engage you the best we can in discussion through this virtual platform um, regarding your roles as drivers of the local system and understand you know, what you might perceive as challenges or needs that you have um, to be addressed so that you can be successful in this role. 
Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone is aware that in addition to the PowerPoint that we have here, um, we've put together an orientation and training guide for chief elected officials. That was provided in paper format for anyone who attended the face-to-face, -face, and we also have it electronically um, here, available at the link on the slide. And I know that Michelle sent it out with the invitation in advance um, of this webinar. So we're hoping that you have this guide with you, um, in front of you. Um, because as we move into the second section of this webinar where we talk about the roles and responsibilities, a lot of that content um, is actually in the orientation guide rather than in the slides themselves. So the slides will have kind of the high level bullet points, um, but you'll really want to be able to refer to that orientation guide. Um, uh, you know, as we move through. And you'll see on the slides that we've referenced page numbers as we're covering content. Um, so that will align with what's in the orientation guide. Okay, uh, it looks like Rhiannon uh, that the slides um, maybe got frozen. I'm not quite sure, but uh, Rhiannon, are you working on, oh, it looks like you are, okay. All right, let's give her a minute. I'm, I'm sorry. I, um, what can you see? I see. Can you see anything? Yes, and it's, um, it says Iowa CEO training. Um, it looks like a very... It's the PowerPoint. Now I see the PowerPoint, and it's showing the slide that says engaging with us, slide number three. Okay. <laughs> And I think what I'll do while you're working on that, no worries. Um, we always have technical difficulties. Oh, I think we're back. <laughs> I will just keep <laughs> us moving forward. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Rhiannon. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's do this high level overview of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And Mike really teed this up perfectly in his kickoff. Um, uh, so thank you, Mike, that was helpful. I'm just going to talk about this um, in a high level way so that you understand what this new law is really all about and why it drives the work that you're doing going forward. So you can go ahead and go forward, please. <clears throat> okay. So the Iowa work system, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about, is governed by WIOA. Um, WIOA was signed into law um, back in 2014. Um, as Mike mentioned, it really was that first major workforce uh, development legislation had passed since 1998. And it outlines uh, really how the public workforce system should be structured and how it should operate. And it really lists out um, several guiding principles um, and, you know, priorities that they want the, the state and the local system to embrace and adopt in order to move forward. Really, the idea around WIOA is that it's demanding alignment of partners and resources. So, up to now, we've had a lot of different programs and partners operating. We still do. WIOA really seeks to transform that system in, into a talent pipeline development tool for communities like yours, for people like you who are chief elected officials, to use it as a tool um, to help your economy grow. So that is really the idea behind WIO, but I'm gonna go a little bit further into these key principles. You can go forward, please, Rhiannon. So the way that um, the law envisions that you'll be able to create that talent pipeline development system is by adopting these five principles. So these are meant to be the foundation for your workforce system. One, we want integrated service delivery. So again, we don't want all these separate partners and programs um, working in silos, but we want them collaborating and coming together to try and best serve both businesses and job seekers and provide the most comprehensive package of services possible. <coughs> Excuse me. We wanna focus on strategy. So this is really critical um, to the local workforce development board, which you're going to appoint. And Lori's gonna talk a little bit about that. They want a local board to be focused on the big picture um, and the strategies that are going to ensure that the folks coming through your talent pipeline and getting services are gonna meet the needs of the employers that 
are hiring folks and operating in your community. There's a focus on regional economic development. Um, so really the idea that we have workforce, economic development, education, social service organizations, they're all coming together on a regional basis to work together. So recognizing again that businesses, you know, they don't care about, you know, arbitrary lines around municipalities. What they really want is something that's operated around a regional economy, around the marketplace that they work in. High quality services. So there's a, an emphasis on providing high quality services and being accountable for providing those services. And that's through a system of performance measurement that's built into the law. And, and you don't need to know a lot about that performance measurement system at all. That's something that will be handled down at the local board level that you will appoint. But we do want you to be aware of it. And we want you to be aware of Brown about these five key principles. So you can go forward, please, Rhiannon. All right, so there are also in WIO what we call these hallmarks of excellence. <clears throat> so the idea is that if you're building your system based on those five principles we just talked about, the outputs of the system, the things that come out of it, will be what the US Department of Labor calls hallmarks of excellence. So these will be indicators that your system is working the way it's supposed to under WIOA. Business and job seekers will drive the workforce solutions. So they, the customer will be um, the focus and will determine the services that you provide and how you provide it. So it's not about meeting the needs of different programs or funding streams. It's about meeting the needs of the businesses and the job seekers in your community. That customer service, the second hallmark, will be, at, will be high quality. So excellent customer service and there will be a continuous focus on improving constantly. So not just achieving status quo and staying there, but always taking a look at how you can do better. And then finally, strong regional economies um, will, uh, will be active in the community and workforce development. So you'll be designing a system that meets the needs of your regional economy. All right. Um, so let me just stop there and just ask quickly um, if there are any questions. Uh, if you think those seem like reasonable goals or expected outcomes for the system, and, and if you'd like, we could try out the little feature that Rhiannon told you about. You could click yes or no um, in the, the toolbar. I've got two yeses. All right. Three. Great. Okay. Please, you know, at any point, if any of this, um, you know, doesn't make sense, or if you have questions, go ahead and, and type those into the chat box. Thank you for your responses. Okay, we can go forward, Rhiannon. All right, so I mentioned that WIOA requires um, alignment um, across various programs and services. Um, it does lay out what those key programs are um, in the law. And uh, these will be referenced sometimes as titles under the law, sometimes just the program name. Um, again, we just want you to be aware of them so that you can understand um, the scope that your local system will be covering. So the programs that are included are employment and training services for adults, dislocated workers, and youth. So those are three specific populations that are served. Um, it is called Title I under, the, under WIOA, under the law, um, and includes a variety of different types of services that can be provided to help those folks find jobs. Title II is our adult education programs. Um, so English as a second uh, language, GED, um, uh, all those various programs that you're probably familiar with. Uh, Title III is Wagner Pizer. That is what we historically called labor exchange. It's basically connecting job seekers with available jobs. So connecting employers and job seekers. Title IV is vocational rehabilitation, which is a very specific set of services that are provided for people with disabilities that qualify. And then there are other programs that are also lumped in under the system. Things like Job Corps, 
youth build, programs for Indian and Native Americans, and migrant and seasonal farm workers. All right, so we can go forward. <coughs> Okay, I mentioned the Iowa Works system up front. Um, just want to connect the dots here for you. Um, Iowa Works is your state's public workforce system. It's your tool to achieve all those things that I just laid out um, under WIOA. It's a network of federally funded programs, essentially, um, although it can also have state level programs as well. And it's how you develop the talent pipeline um, in Iowa. That you can go forward. Um, and, and let me just ask quickly, if you don't mind, um, are you familiar with Iowa Works? I, when we did go out and do some of these trainings before, there were folks in the room that actually weren't familiar with Iowa Works. And so it was a good opportunity to, to inform them about that. So if you could click yes or no um, on the toolbar, we would love to know. Are you familiar with Iowa Works? Okay. All right, good. All right, so let's go forward. So the Iowa Works system. So the Iowa Works is essentially um, a network of offices, physical centers that both businesses and job seeker, seekers can go into, folks looking for better work, new work. Um, maybe they're unemployed right now or they've just been laid off. They could be youth. Um, looking for services, all of those different customers I mentioned under those various programs can access services through Iowa Works. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but we just wanted you to get an idea of what are the types of services that people can access. Things like case management, they can be assessed. And when we say assessment, we talk about, you know, what are what, what kind of skills experience do you have now? What is your education level? And then what do you need? What are your barriers and how can we help you overcome them? Help with career exploration, resume writing, training, all sorts of things. And then businesses can also receive services and do um, through Iowa Works. <clears throat> they post jobs. Um, they can get referrals, people to be referred over to available jobs. Things like customized training where um, the system can create training to meet the specific needs of a business um, as well as on the job training. So there's support for that as well where folks um, can be hired and re the business can receive some temporary support to train them, financial support, and incumbent worker training. Okay, we can go forward. And just to provide you with a snapshot of your system, you have 15 comprehensive uh, Iowa work centers or nationally they're called American job centers and 12 affiliate offices. That term comprehensive and affiliate, it just implies the degree of services or level of services that are provided. Um, last year, total individuals served was 173,206. So a lot of folks accessing these services. And then we wanted to mention that there are also some key statewide initiatives that also are happening um, in Iowa. There are workforce development initiatives that I think have been really spearheaded by the governor. And those are all integrated with the Iowa Works system. So there are also things that you as a chief elected official would want to know about and have on your radar screen. So things like Future Ready Iowa, which has a goal of 70% of the state having some type of post-secondary credential by 2025. Or Home Base Iowa, which uh, seeks to link veterans um, from all over the world with jobs in Iowa. And then, um, you know, the governor and the state workforce board are always looking at new priorities, new initiatives, um, new ways to uh, improve your outcomes in your talent development system. Okay, we can go forward. All right, so uh, this slide we put in so that you can hopefully have an understanding of how the funding flows. Um, and the governance structure for this workforce system. And Lori in her section is going to break this down for you a little bit more because I know that this can feel a little confusing. Uh, it's a lot on a screen, um, but we just wanted to walk you through this and we can answer any questions that you have. So you'll see at the top here of this chart is the U.S. Department of Labor. So that's 
the source for the federal funding. Um, and the US Department of Labor has uh, oversight requirements and compliance requirements over the states um, and the local areas. And they, it also provides technical assistance. So this is why you've heard us mention monitoring reports from the US Department of Labor, um, why Mike mentioned up front that there are some changes that need to be made to ensure that you're compliant with WIOA. And that's the Department of Labor's um, role to help you do that. Um, um, the money then goes to the governor, who is right under DOL, um, and the governor needs some place administratively to park that money, right, and to have that money managed. And that goes to the state workforce agency, which in Iowa is Iowa Workforce Development. Um, you'll, and you'll see here there's multiple state agencies meant, uh, mentioned over here in this right-hand box, and that is because um, while the much of the money goes to IWD, other agencies at the state are involved as well. Um, those different titles I mentioned under WIOA, for example, that the Vocational Rehabilitation Program for People with Disabilities, that is administered by your State Department of Education. So that is why they are also included in the state agencies box. Over to the left, you'll see the box for the State Workforce Development Board. Um, that is a visionary uh, board that is appointed by the governor. Um, every state has one. <clears throat> and um, so they uh, work closely with the state agencies and then also with all of you, as you can see. Uh, you'll see below <clears throat> that IWD has oversight for the role that the chief elected officials play in the local system. So all of you, the chief elected officials serve as the grant subrecipient and you have liability for the funds. And I know this is <coughs> a key concern and something that Lori is going to talk about much more in depth when she gets into her section. And the CEOs designate a chief lead elected official um, and the CLEO or chief lead elected official appoints the local workforce development board. Um, they may also designate a fiscal agent, and again, we'll get more into that in a minute, um, and they receive the funds and pay the bills. Um, and then the local workforce board is the governing body for the local workforce development area, and we're going to talk a lot about local workforce development areas. Uh, that's a, been a key point of discussion. Um, the board governs what happens in the area and sets the policy for that area and, and does the strategic planning. And then the local board, in conjunction with the CLEO, uh, they procure a one-stop operator. And they are responsible for coordinating all the services that are delivered through those Iowa work centers. OK. Let's go ahead and go forward. Are there, are there any, any questions? questions? Uh, Lori, uh, do you see any questions, questions in the chat box? Um, nope, but Stacy is here. Fantastic. <laughs> Welcome, Stacy. We just got to your slides. Hi there. Can you all, can you hear me, Lynn? I can. You sound loud and clear. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to cover the next couple of slides um, and talk a little bit about the Iowa challenge. And just a reminder, Stacy is with the U.S. Department of Labor uh, Regional Office in Chicago. Hi, hey, everyone. Um, thanks for being here and thanks for having me. Um, I, as I said, work for the U.S. Department of Labor, the Employment and Training Administration, um, the regional office in Chicago. And uh, my team here in Chicago oversees the implementation, um, administration, operation, a number of workforce programs. Um, primarily uh, WIOA, which we're here to talk about today. Um, and we also oversee the system, work system that WIOA um, uh, intends and uh, creates. Uh, Stacy, uh, we're actually getting quite a bit of feedback um, as you, you talk. I don't know if you have any other audio options. I turn this. Is it still happening or? I think that might be a little bit better. 
okay, just turned it down a little bit. So uh, let me know if it's still because of a problem. I can call in. I, yeah, it's still continuing. Okay. Um, all right, I am going to uh, uh, leave the meeting and I will call back in. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, while we wait for Stacy to uh, rejoin, um, Lori, were there any questions in the chat box so far or any comments? Um, there haven't been any questions, but we have a suggestion. We have a number of folks who have called in, but who are on their phones and perhaps aren't um, on a screen. So, um, Rhiannon, could we unmute folks for just a minute? And if you are a CEO, if you're a chief elected official from a county and you have called in on your phone, um, can you tell us um, who you are and what county you're from? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody just go. <laughs> Tim, Tim Latham, Sir Grota County. Hi, Tim. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Pam, jo Pam Jordan, Dickinson County. Uh, Rick Larkin in Lee County. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Do we have any others? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Lori. All right, let me check my participant list to see if Stacy, have you rejoined? Yeah. <laughs> you said a week and a half. Nope, not yet. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, why don't I go ahead and take a stab at covering Stacy's slides. Um, and when she rejoins us, I, you know, she can chime in and provide any additional information directly um, from the U.S. Department of Labor's perspective. All right. Uh, so the Iowa challenge. So as I think Stacy was about to lay out, um, currently, Iowa Works, your system, is not compliant with uh, the principles or some of the key provisions of WIOA. So basically, WIOA passed in 2014, as we said, and there are certain requirements for the governance structure that were never established in the state. And that is why we are moving forward now uh, with the system transformation effort. Uh, both because of these requirements and also because there are opportunities um, to take advantage of some of those innovations that I talked about in those key principles and hallmarks of excellence that you also want to be able to implement in Iowa. So the two things do go hand in hand. Um, and Stacy could talk more in depth about this when she rejoins, but uh, the U.S. Department of Labor the Employment Training Administration, which is the office that she covers, um, designated IWD as being in at-risk status due to the extent of the noncompliance. So, you know, as I mentioned back with that slide, the org chart, um, IWD is designated as your state workforce agency, and that is why then they are the recipient of that at-risk status. Um, that is who DOL works directly with um, to impose these changes. Uh, ETA required IWD to develop and execute a corrective action plan, which was submitted um, and it is being worked through as we speak. Um, that is a huge part of what this system transformation is about, are several key provisions that need to be fixed in order to implement that corrective action plan. Um, and then ETA has done subsequent on-site monitoring um, and issued reports, and some of you may have seen those reports that confirmed the compliance issues and required corrective action. So this has all been done very officially um, using official monitoring reports that lay out what the requirements are and the, the things that have to be fixed. All right, let me do a check-in. Stacy, have you joined? No? Okay. Then I will keep going. Um, Lynn, I think she's here. 
Stacy, oh. can you hear me? Hey, Stacy, yeah. I think we can. Okay, let me. And I think you're going to be clearer this time. I don't hear any feedback. So, Stacy, did you hear um, what I just covered for this slide? Oh, Stacy, we... you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> it's a day of technical difficulties all around, so no, don't worry about it. Um, I just basically covered these bullet points on the Iowa Challenge slide and um, thought you might want to provide more in-depth information. Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, we had back in um, 20, like maybe a year or so after WIOA um, was implemented, all of the regional offices, ETA regional offices across the country uh, did assessments of where each state was at in terms of implementing WIOA. And it was at that time that we determined that uh, statewide Iowa was at risk in terms of implementation because there were a number of pieces that uh, just were not where uh, they needed to be. Uh, the state board was not WIOA compliant at the time. Um, the local boards were still uh, trying to come into compliance and uh, there were a number of different roles and structures locally, like one-stop operators um, that had not come into compliance yet either in Iowa. So, um, so, the, so the state was designated to be at risk. And um, as you see on the slide here, um, the state did start to put together a corrective action plan. Um, and shortly after that, and you can go to the next slide, shortly after that, we, um, we conducted an on-site uh, monitoring visit in Iowa. And it was really that visit that um, sort of revealed the extent of um, the compliance issues and uh, really targeted us in terms of um, what some of the uh, or what the issues uh, were and are in Iowa. Um, and just to give you, uh, you know, a big picture look at, at some of the things that we found in that on-site monitoring um, we discovered that the funding was not, the WIOA funding was not being distributed in a compliant manner. Um, if you think back to the slide that Lynn talked about with the, uh, with the graphic about how the money flows, um, when the money, once the, our money goes to the state workforce agency, in this case IWD, um, that money uh, needs to be allocated to the local system um, and it is to be allocated to the, the grant recipient, as Lynn said, that is, um, that is you all, the chief local elected officials in each of the designated local areas. Um, what we found in Iowa was that the money was sort of bypassing the chief local elected official and going straight to uh, service providers for WIOA Title I. Um, and in many cases of that, in, in the Iowa, that's the community colleges. So, uh, that was really a big sort of foundational kind of uh, issue that um, from there creates a number of other kinds of, a uh, number of other problems. The other big picture piece um, 
was that the funding uh, was being spread across the current 15 uh, local workforce development areas. And um, that structure we found really dated back to uh, the 1980s and workforce legislation that uh, required local areas to be uh, formed around uh, service delivery. And uh, WIOA really looks more at uh, labor market information and commuting patterns and uh, that kind of criteria in determining its local areas. So the 15 local areas uh, was spreading our funding, our limited WIOA funding, really very thin. Um, and the structures uh, that WIOA requires locally, there just weren't the resources to fund those structures. Um, and so what we're what we're looking for moving forward, as is illustrated on this slide, um, we're really looking, uh, we really in Iowa need the CEOs uh, to become much more engaged uh, in the local workforce system that exists in their either their current or in whatever this system is going to look like moving forward um, and the local system needs to be uh, structured in a way that allows sufficient funding um, and it doesn't just have to be WIOA but there needs to be sufficient WIOA funding in each local workforce development area to allow for um, maximum uh, funding of services to customers, as well as funding for some of those key roles uh, that uh, we're missing or are missing right now in, in Iowa. Um, and I think that if you all can, um, you know, uh, bear with us and the state as we work through this process um, and assist in, in driving the transformation that needs to happen. Um, I think that if you can put that hard work in up front that, um, you know, soon Iowa will have uh, highly functioning local workforce areas that are in compliance and um, you all will uh, be in a much better place in terms of uh, the liability for the funds as well as um, you'll have a system that is efficient and operates um, without uh, putting an undue burden on you all um, as CEOs, because it will be, it will operate on its own with the appropriate checks and balances in place. Any questions for me? Any questions for Stacy? If you want to go ahead and type in the chat box. Okay, and it, you know, as we continue to move forward, if questions come up, don't hesitate to raise them. Stacy's going to stay on the line. All right, thank you, Stacy. All right, Marianne, and we can move forward. All right, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of compliance. Um, so. Obviously, <laughs> assurance of continued federal funding, um, that's essential 
to supporting job seekers and employers in your state is the primary benefit, right? I think in that earlier slide, we saw that, you know, you're serving over 173,000 people a year who are benefiting from WIOA. Um, <clears throat> so that's not a small number. Um, and this is a pretty important tool that you have available to you to help grow, you know, your community and economic development. So it's pretty critical that we get the right things in place so that we ensure that that money continues to flow. And then also just a reminder that, you know, the governance structure that we always put into place, it, it did it for good reason. Um, it was lessons learned over the years around what works well and what doesn't. Um, and the fact that we actually had bipartisan agreement, <laughs> uh, which we never have anymore, right? But there was bipartisan agreement around what these key provisions need to be. And that's why it was baked into this law for every state in the country to incorporate into their, their system. And just a reminder, you know, that those are promoting accountability, transparency, and high quality services. Um, supporting that role of workforce development as a regional economic development tool so that workforce development, economic development, education, all of those systems are actually working together. Um, aligning programs and services. So again, making sure these, that folks are not operating in their little programmatic silos so that you're actually leveraging your resources effectively and streamlining service delivery and providing that best customer service possible. And then this is the last one, which is really critical for you all, is empowering local boards, which are appointed by the uh, CLIO, to drive a strategic vision for talent development in your communities. All right, so let's stop briefly and just see if there are any questions. Um, <clears throat> I think we also have a polling question at this point. Um, Rhiannon, could you go ahead and pull up the first polling question? And we'll see um, if folks are able to use this feature in our Zoom platform. All right. How would you rate your knowledge of the workforce system transformation effort? So uh, you have I'm in the know, I know enough to be dangerous, or I wish I knew more. <laughs> All right, we've got one person that says, I know enough to be dangerous. I'm in the know, great, okay. All right. Anyone else wanna click on the poll? Okay. Well, this is helpful um, because actually what we're gonna do now is talk a little bit about the system transformation, give you some more information and give you some updates um, and let you ask any questions that you might have about it. Okay. Lynn, so, this is Lori. Um, yeah. so we know that we've got a couple people who have dialed in um, and they're not um, at their computer where they could send in a question on the chat. Um, could we, um, unmute folks, uh, Rhiannon, and see um, if any of our callers have any questions about the stuff we just went over. That's a great idea. Anyone have a question they want to raise at this point? I, I think we're hearing someone else's phone conversation, actually. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and mute the lines. All right, and let's move on to the system transformation slides. Okay, um, so I think all three of us now, both Mike, Stacy, myself, we have talked about the system transformation. Um, let me just be candid with you. What, what we mean by that term in this case is not just the realignment of local areas, because I, we know that that is something that you all may have heard about first. Um, we know it's a primary concern, and we are going to talk about it. Um, but as you heard from Stacy, that is just one aspect of what you all needed to do to 
get your system into compliance with WIOA. Um, so there are many other aspects that have to be transformed, and that's why we decided to adopt this term of system transformation um, to let everyone know that it's broader than just realignment. So let's talk a little bit about the steps <clears throat> for the system transformation. You can go ahead and go forward, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is a brief timeline. <clears throat> um, in February of this, pa this year, the state board voted on the realignment. So that did start things in motion, the realignment did. Um, and it, we'll talk a little bit about what that configuration looks like. Um, and then in September, your state board voted on administrative and governance policies, many of which the state did not have in place and had to be in place in order uh, to check one of those requirements off the list. And as you know, we did those face-to-face -face trainings um, for the chief elected officials. We did one for the State Workforce Development Board, as well as a couple of webinars. Now, going forward, our um, goal dates to have the steps uh, executed that Lori is actually gonna lay out in her section of this training. So I'm just gonna cover this in a high level way. We're hopeful that by January of next year that CEO agreements might be in place and she'll explain what that entails. Uh, by February that CLIOs may appoint <clears throat> new local workforce development boards and that we'll be able to start training those boards on their role and mission as a group. Um, in April, the local boards will develop their local WIOA plans. That is a requirement under the law that local workforce areas have to develop plans. Um, in June of next year, there the state is able to execute funding agreements with the CLIOs. Again, as Stacy mentioned, to get that money flowing the correct way under the law. And by December of next year, certifying the one stops. And that is actually another requirement under WIOA. We can talk a little bit about what that actually means, but it's basically saying that your one stop meets the, the requirements and the standards um, that your state has put into place. All right, you can go ahead and go forward. Um, so just to recap quickly on this, the first step was the realignment and that this gets at that point that Stacy mentioned that there's limited funding and this transformation requires uh, each local area to undertake activities um, that previously this local, the local areas did not and that requires resources. So in recognition of that, the state board reduced the local areas from 15 to six. Uh, you see here on the slide, it will create much needed cost efficiencies, maximize funding so that you can focus your resources on services to job seekers and businesses. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I want to mention um, an upcoming meeting that you've all received an invitation to. It is a consultation session for chief elected officials. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it and certainly understand that you may have questions that we are gonna be happy to, to try to answer. So as we did those trainings, the face-to-face -face trainings with chief elected officials around the state back in September and October, um, the state, IWD, all of us in the room, we heard pretty loud and clear from the CEOs that once they knew all of the things that had to happen under the law, all of those required provisions, that actually even going down to six local areas, that may be too many to sustain with the limited funding that's available. So because we heard that message loud and clear, uh, the state has decided to gather the chief elected officials together for a consultation session. And at that session, they will present out um, a handful of options for your consideration of how local areas could be configured. So right now you're looking at six. Um, there may be an option for four. There could be an option for three. Um, there it could be uh, various different arrangements. Uh, but all of those different configurations will be based on the criteria that is listed in the law 
around how you determine um, local workforce development areas. So it's an opportunity to revisit this decision of six. The goal of the meeting would be to arrive at a recommendation for a new configuration of local workforce areas. They're based on the economic patterns again, that's what's in the law, and would be sustainable um, with the limited administrative dollars. And that would be a recommendation for consideration by the State Workforce Development Board. Uh, that meeting is scheduled to happen November 20th um, from 9 to 3 at Goodwill of Central Iowa in Johnston. Um, and we are uh, hoping that as many folks as possible will be able to join that session in person. Um, that will be the, obviously the most effective way to engage in dialogue. Um, and we are looking at a virtual option as well. So I want to share all that with you and let's pause and see if we have any questions around that. Let's see, and I see one in the chat. Concern was that there was not enough local development areas, not that there need to be fewer. Um, <clears throat> I, Loris, I can respond to that. And then of course, anyone else, uh, Michelle, Lori, Mike, please feel free to. I, I think we did hear from some folks of the two that I attended, a concern around um, closing offices. Um, is that going to limit access to services? Is that geography going to be too difficult to work together? I think there were some of those concerns that were raised. Um, I think they were addressed. Um, making sure that folks know that none of, the, of what would be discussed um, would would um, result in the requirement to close local offices. That is not a decision that's made um, at the state level, the locals, you would still have control over that. Um, and so that, that was raised, but I think when folks understood all of the things that had to happen in terms of hiring board staff, executing agreements, um, appointing local boards, that what we've heard pretty clearly from the vast majority was that six was too many. But let me stop others on the line. Do you want to chime in? Sure. This is Lori. Hi, Loris. Um, you know, there was a, at the six training sessions that happened across Iowa, there were a variety of conversations that happened around this issue. And, and I think that that is um, even more reason to have the consultation session so that um, you and other supervisors across the state can have those discussions and um, make, make your voices heard to IWD on this issue. Hey, thank you. Um, and, and this is Michelle, and I would just add that, you know, we wanna bring everybody together and have the opportunity to review the criteria that needs to be used when looking at how a local workforce development area should be designated, um, looking at commuting patterns, looking at population centers, economic development areas, all of the criteria that's in the law, going over that uh, labor market information data together so that everyone can see the information and then making um, hopefully a recommendation based off that information. So that's really the point of the meeting is to give everybody the opportunity to review it and, and talk about it as a group. Great, thank you. Let's see, we've got a couple of other questions here. Is the money distributed per capita slash population? <clears throat> um, Stacy, are you still on the line and do you wanna talk a little bit about this question around how the money, the formula is determined? Can you hear me, Lynn? I can. Um, so, I, I don't see the question, oh, is the money distributed per capita? Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's a formula in the, uh, in the statute, the WIOA statute, that um, is, it's an allocation formula that's used, and uh, it's based on a, a number of different things. I don't have it in front of me. Um, typically, it's related to uh, more to uh, unemployment, 
uh, low income, those kinds of things. And um, I can, um, while you all are moving forward, I will open up my uh, my statute and uh, in the chat, I will type in the um, the what the formula looks like. Great, thank you. Um, I see a comment from Loris about, yes, yeah, six hours, a large time commitment, um, only be able to attend the morning session. Okay, yes, I mean, we understand that it, it will be difficult for some folks to get there. Um, and again, I think the plan is to try and provide a virtual option as well. Um, and Darren, I agree that as I've learned more about the requirements, how money needs to be spent on support staff and the CEO's limited roles, that there is no need to have six areas. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing that. All right. Any other questions or comments either from the audience on the line or from IWD? Okay then let's go forward. <clears throat> okay, uh, we just wanted to share this so you have it in your back pocket. This is the currently approved six area local configuration. As I mentioned, um, you know, that will be up for discussion on November 20th. All right, and the next slide. All right. Uh, also want to recognize and uh, make sure you're aware, if you're not, uh, you may probably already are aware that USDOL has received um, appeals from uh, local uh, chief elected officials regarding the process that was used to identify this new local workforce area configuration. So that map of six. Um, and per the federal appeals process, DOL requested information and documentation from Iowa regarding that process, um, which Iowa has provided. And um, right now the appeal is still under consideration um, at the national office level with the Department of Labor. So a decision has not been rendered on the appeal. Um, uh, but the decision has been made, and it's really the only choice, is to move forward during the appeals process um, because Iowa remains out of compliance, um, not just with, well, with all aspects, really, of the system transformation that we laid out. Are there any questions around that or anything that anyone would like to add? No? Okay, then let's go forward. All right, we just wanna make sure you're aware, um, I think you all are at this point, that as I mentioned, the system transformation is, is a big, broad effort. Um, we did work with IWD to create a framework or a plan that is the roadmap, that's where you got at that timeline slide that I showed you before, around what this transformation looks like and, and how it's going to, to roll out. Um, it will run through the end of next year and it will involve steps for key stakeholders, including yourselves, the state workforce board, the local workforce development boards, and then those core partner agencies that I mentioned up front under WIOA. All right, and go forward. This is just more information around what's taken place so far and the timing of those things, um, the various trainings that were held, the policies that were issued. Right now, um, the state folks are working dil diligently on developing their WIOA state plan. That's also another requirement that will have to be approved by the state board in order for you to all be compliant with WIOA. And the activities will continue. All right. Okay, so that's the information we have on the system transformation. Are there any questions in addition to what we've already talked about? Any comments? Okay. Janet, yeah. Janet if we could unmute, um, so for the people who have called in to see if they have any questions. Thank you. Any questions from folks on the phone? Comments? No? Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, I think what we'd like to do now, I um, let's do that. Let's take five minutes and let folks um, step away from their desks. Uh, I have that it's 1108. So we will come back together at 1113. And then Lori will uh, take over and talk specifically about the roles and responsibilities of chief elected officials. All right, see you at 1113.
Okay, we are going to get started back. Um, hopefully you were able to um, grab some water or more coffee or, or whatever uh, you need to, to get through the next little bit with us. Um, Rhiannon, if you would go ahead and forward to the next slide. And then you can just go on to the next one. So um, you've seen this slide once today. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, Chief Elected Officials Orientation and Training Guide. This was sent out um, in an email and or the uh, meeting invitation. You can also find it at the State Workforce Board website that's located. Uh, we've got the link or the, the address there on the slide. We are going to use this guide for the next little bit. Um, we are in no way going to go through every single page. Uh, we're going to hit just a, key, a few key points. So if you don't have it in front of you right now, that, that's fine. You'll be able to find, um, like I said, the link to it at the State Workforce Board website. And um, that's really just a a guide and a how-to on uh, your entire role as a chief elected official within the uh, public workforce system. So we're going to be referencing it. Um, I will let you know what page we're on um, as we move about, um, move about the guide. So the first thing that we would just want to uh, make sure that um, you all are aware of. We keep using this term CEO or chief elected official. That, that comes straight out of the, uh, the law, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And there are some specific roles and responsibilities given to those um, elected officials at the county level. And so that's what we're gonna talk to you all about today. Um, everything um, in terms of the role that we're going to share with you today um, isn't coming from IWD. They, they aren't the ones who decided that this would be the role for um, the chair of the Board of Supervisors or uh, one of the other supervisors. This all comes, comes from the law. And so that's, I um, thought that that was good background information for you to have. So as I mentioned, um, the, the designation of chief elected official comes from the law. And as IWD was looking at what are the elected positions across Iowa, it was determined that the chair of the County Board of Supervisors was the best uh, position uh, within Iowa to be designated as the chief elected official. And so the policy that the State Workforce Board has passed is that the designation of chief elected official uh, is to be the chair of the Board of Supervisors or a designee from within the Board of Supervisors. So um, this is a role that the chief elected official um, can't designate away. Um, and we're gonna get into why that is in a little bit. Um, there's some significant um, fiduciary responsibilities and, and liability and I think that as that becomes, um, becomes more evident, evident and, and you become more familiar with that. Um, if anybody had a question about wanting to designate somebody to be in their place, you'll, you'll quickly see why uh, retaining that responsibility um, at the elected official level um, is really important. Um, chief elected officials are grouped together based on that on the local workforce development area configuration. So in Iowa, there have been 15 um, local areas right now. Iowa is moving forward with six local areas. But as you all know, and as Lynn mentioned a few slides ago, there is going to be a consultation session um, to look at what could be a configuration of local workforce um, areas in Iowa that could work um, differently. So, but anyway, uh, regardless of the configuration, elected officials are grouped together based on that local workforce development area grouping. And then just the, the, the chief elected official, I, I tend to look at it as the foundational piece of the local governance of, um, the, the workforce system. Um, the, the, that governance structure has to be in place 
so that the rest of the system can be built upon it. And if you recall when Stacy was talking, she talked a lot about the governance structure and that's really where um, Iowa has um, fallen out of compliance is, is in the governance structure. And so if you think about it, um, uh, you all have to, IWD has to help you all get that part right so that the rest of the system built upon that can, can be right. So that's, um, that's really the key role of the, the chief elected official is to be the foundation at the local level for the system. Next slide. So um, this is a, this was taken out of the organizational chart that we showed you a few slides back. If you recall, um, the bigger organizational chart had the US Department of Labor at the very top and then went all the way down to the um, Iowa Works customers at the bottom. What we've done here on this slide is just pull out the middle section so that we can talk about the governance structure. Um, so you have chief elected officials and chief lead elected officials at the top and then a connection down to the local workforce development board and to the fiscal agent. Um, the, the, what, we want, um, what we want to do with this slide is to make sure that it's clear that the, your role as a chief elected official for purposes of the workforce system, your role is, is different from the role of the local workforce development board. The, the chief elected official um, group, and I know that in Iowa, uh, it's commonly referred to as a CEO board, um, but that, that grouping, that coming together of chief elected officials, you all don't have the role of the local workforce development board and vice versa, the local workforce development board does not have your role. There are a number of shared responsibilities and in the guide, those are outlined and we'll talk about one or two of those today. We, we definitely won't talk about all of them, but it's, it's important that you know that as the foundation for the local governance structure, um, that local workforce development board is working for you. You are not working for it and you all are not performing the same functions. And um, what we're focusing on today is your all's role as the chief elected officials. Now, let me, you know, I'll be the first to say the role of the local workforce development board is obviously very clear or not clear, but it's also very important. And, and they, um, they play a huge part in um, oversight and strategic vision and planning for the services delivered at the local level. So I'm not, I don't want to give the impression that I think that their role is less than or anything else, but just trying to make the distinction between, between the two. Next slide. Okay, so what we're going to cover today um, is, is listed out here. Um, for those of you, and I know we've got a couple folks um, who are on the, the, the call today who have attended one of the in-person sessions. Um, for those of you who attended the first or second session, the one in Osceola and then the one in Des Moines, um, we, have, we are going to pare down the content greatly. Um, we know that we, we overwhelmed you guys that were in Osceola and we, um, we threw a lot of info at you. So we're definitely not going to do that again. And we're going to focus on these topics today. Of course, if you have any questions that come up about these topics or anything else, we will do our absolute best to answer those. So as we're going through, um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And then as we did before, uh, whenever we stop on those questions slides, um, we will unmute the phones so that our, our friends that have called in and who don't have access to the chat box can get their, uh, can get their questions asked as well. So we're going to, to jump in. So on page 31 um, in your guide um, is information on 
What um, IWD, in terms of their policies and what the state board has passed, referred to as a CEO shared liability agreement, um, known commonly in Iowa as a 28E agreement. Um, for the purposes of the work that you all will do as elected officials around the workforce system, you all will enter into a 28E agreement. IWD has provided you with a template for that agreement. Um, you are not, as the group of elected officials, you are not required to use that template, but the um, sections um, listed on it, if you don't use the template, you still have to address each of those questions. Um, so you could, at the least, use it as a guide for what you would put into your own agreement that you create. We understand that this is a starting point for the uh, for any group of elected officials, and we also understand that um, attorney county attorneys get involved in review and all of that. So, um, though that template is available, um, there's a copy of it in the guide on page 58. But what you where you can go to the state workforce board you'd be able to pull it down and it would literally be a template that you can uh, type into um, as you all come together as a group of CEOs and have some, some of those necessary conversations. So with that, we're gonna go on to the um, next section. So um, Lynn has mentioned the role of the chief lead elected official. You've seen it on um, the organizational chart slide. This is a um, position or a designation that the law talks about. Um, so as a group of chief elected officials, you all are going to designate a chief lead elected official. And um, within your 28E agreement, you're going to need to outline the process that you use to designate the CLEO or chief lead elected official. The role of the CLEO is to serve um, sort of as a chairman of the board, if you will, but um, your groups of CEOs don't necessarily have to be organized as a board, but that's just a, a, a close, um, descriptor, I suppose. The, CLE, the CLEO uh, will sign agreements that need to be signed on behalf of the CEOs, and the CLEO will bring you all together um, to um, have meetings or, or whatever needs to happen. They will serve really as the convener of the group. So you all will, that's as you all organize as a group of uh, chief elected officials, that really needs to be your first um, course of action is to determine who um, is going to be the CLEO. And then of course that needs to be documented, not just the process, but who is serving as the CLEO. Um, and that goes into your um, 28E agreement. So next slide. So, we have um, um, a polling question that we uh, want to ask. So, Rhiannon, if you would bring up that poll, and then um, Lynn, if you can let me know if there have been any questions around, um, or any questions that have come through the chat, um, we can be ready to answer those after we take a look at the poll. Do we? Yes. So, how is the chief lead elected official determined? The CLEOs decide, IWD makes the decision, or it's always the chief elected official from the county with the highest population? So while that's happening, Lynn, have there been questions um, that have come through the chat that we could, uh, that we need to answer? 
Um, not any questions that I see. However, just want to make sure everyone saw that Stacy did um, post the formula, the the uh, criteria that goes into the formula for allocating WIOA funds in the chat box. Okay, great. Thanks, Stacy, for doing that. Okay, so I think we can close the poll. That's awesome. Well, pat yourselves on the back. We had a uh, hundred. Everybody who answered it got it right. So good job, everybody. Um, we hope that that's just a little bit helpful to reinforce the content and then also to take a break from uh, listening to my voice, I guess, for a little bit. Um, so can we unmute the phones and let's see if anybody who has called in any of the elected officials that have called in, if they have any questions about what we've covered so far. So I just unmuted everybody, um, but there was a, another one in the chat from Darren. Okay. Uh, so, when, do you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. When we met in Creston, there was a hesitation to elect a Clio due to some liability questions. Have those been addressed? So, um, Michelle, does I w can IWD, do you all have any guidance that you want to issue on that? And then, but before you do that, Darren, is that around um, um, insurance and that sort of stuff? Was that the, was that the question of the day? I think it was. I think so too. I, I remember um, there being several questions that came from one of the CEO's attorneys, I believe, county attorneys. And I, I think that, yes, those questions have been sent out. I'm not exactly sure who they were sent to, so I'm checking with Linda Rouse right now. Okay. But I will go back and make sure that we get those sent out again as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, there is not a requirement within WIOA that um, there be liability insurance and and we're going to get into this in just a little bit but i do recall this being one of the questions that day there is no requirement there um i think though that and stacy may want to weigh in on this too i think that um, as you all do your due diligence at the county level those are conversations that you have with um with your um, insurance folks um, and with your county auditors and those sorts of things, but from a um, legislative perspective and from an IWD perspective, there's not a requirement for liability insurance. Would anybody else want to add to that? Okay. Another question um, that I'm seeing is, and Loris has raised a question about the timeline. So we want to just address, uh, address that. Her question is, your timeline dictated that the Clio be determined by November 1. Um, yes, we realize that we're uh, past November 1st. So uh, Region 3 uh, CEOs voted by email and we'll put permanent processing in between. That's great. But I want to I want to address the timeline. You know, we put in the uh, guide and we trained at the six training sessions to those deadlines. We understand um, that um, that first deadline has come and gone. We also know that a good number of the local areas have appointed or designated their Clio. But to the overall issue of timelines, as IWD was putting the training materials together and really wanting to move the entire system transformation forward, uh, system, system transformation process forward, they decided it was very important that some deadlines and timelines be put in there because if not, um, the training would end up being well, here's the stuff that you need to do, but we're really not sure when you need to do it by. So they, they put in some really well thought out um, deadlines and, and we realized that the appeal process and those sorts of things are, are a big factor in that. So all of that to say, 
when you look at the guide, if you haven't looked at it or if you haven't looked at it yet, um, you'll see some deadlines in there. And at this point, um, those, those are not necessarily thrown out the window, but um, IWD wants you all to know that they understand that there's going to have to be some flexibility that they give in how and when those are met. So just wanted to address that up front. Um, and Laura, thank you. I know you weren't necessarily asking that, but thank you for raising that so that we could talk about it a little bit. So, all right. And then if you are a, if you are from an area that has already um, determined their chief lead elected official, and you are the chief lead elected official, if you could let us know that in the chat, that would be great too. And does anybody have anything else or are we, can we go on, uh, do we wanna go on to the next slide? All right, so let's just go on and remember to get your questions typed in the box if you, uh, if, if you have that ability and then if not, we'll just stop um, as we've been doing. So, the next thing that we want to talk to you about is your role as the chief elected officials. One of the biggest things that you all will do is you all appoint the local workforce development board. And we want to talk you all through um, those membership categories. Um, there, no one, no one else appoints the board except you all. Um, and additionally, um, you all as elected officials will determine a process for receiving nominations to the board. And then it is that chief lead elected official who signs off on nominations and does the actual appointment to the board. So that's one of the roles of the CLEO is um, based on input on the nomination process from all of the CEOs, then the CLEO does the signing off on who, who is the board that represents your all's local area. So on page 17 in your guide, we are going to walk through the four um, categories of local workforce development board membership. And let me say um, that based on the law, the law gives required seats and then gives some flexibility on some optional seats. The, and we're gonna present both of those to you today and then talk about um, maybe other optional seats that you all could have. But just know that regardless of the number of counties in your local workforce development area, if a local board that you appoint only does the minimum requirement. So in other words, you only fill the seats that you must fill and you do not fill the seats that you may fill. Your board is 17 members, okay? Now, you all as elected officials have the ability to make that bigger, but you don't have the ability to make that smaller. And these are requirements that come out of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Uh, these are completely out of the act and IWD has not made any additional requirements to uh, local workforce boards. So let's move to the next slide. And the first, um, the first membership category that we want to talk about is the business representatives. Um, some people may refer to this as private sector representatives. I may refer to it as private sector representatives, but just know that that's, those words are interchangeable and mean the same thing. So the most important thing for you to know on this one is that your business representatives must be 51% of the board, uh, regardless of the size of your board. They must always be 51%. The reason for that is, um, there's a few reasons for that, but, but the biggest one is, is that the, the system is to be um, demand driven and, and demand is by the, the groups of, of it, businesses and those sorts of things that, that hire folks. And so they truly need to be the loudest voice in the room. And so the act, um, the act makes that a requirement. So even if you all 
um, add, choose at the local level to add seats to your local workforce board. Um, um, you have to keep in mind that um, that percentage requirement. So if you add a government seat, we'll talk about that in a second, um, then you have to go back and add a uh, business representative seat. They always have to be 51% regardless of the size. In addition to that, um, and Rhiannon, if you would mute, um, mute. I, I heard a little bit of feedback there and I'm so highly distractible. It will, um, it'll. So um, up with the business representatives being 51%, uh, must be 51%. There's some additional requirements uh, within that. Um, they must be owners, chief executives, or operating officers of, um, of businesses. And, and by that, they mean they have to be in a policymaking position or have hiring authority. So the example that I gave in the face-to-face -face training, um, I'll give it here. Um, you may uh, have a person from the uh, local hospital on your board. It can't be the um, administrative assistant or the receptionist who greets people whenever they walk in the hospital. It can be the CEO, it can be the chief financial officer, it can even be the HR manager. It has to be somebody who can speak to the work of the hospital and the hiring needs and the talent development needs and those sorts of things and somebody who has um, the ability because of their position to speak with authority. Additionally, um, the businesses that um, are targeted for membership on the board, they must provide employment. They must, at, at, a, basic, they, at a basic level, they must provide employment in your area, but then they also have to be providing employment in an in-demand industry sector. Now, um, I'm confident that you all as elected officials generally know who, um, who those entities are in your county and in the neighboring counties who are doing hiring and who are in demand and who are growing and those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, um, if you needed some data on that, uh, IWD's um, labor market department would be able to help you with that. And, and they've got, got some data that they can share so that you all make, you know, truly informed decisions on that. So those positions, uh, they have to be from in-demand sectors or occupations in your local area. Um, I use the example in training and it's, a, it's an extreme example, but I think it, it fits here. I'm from Kentucky. I'm talking to you all today from Kentucky. And in Eastern Kentucky, we have a lot of coal mines. And coal is not really an in-demand sector anymore. It used to be a very high demand job and those sorts of things. So the example is, is that the local workforce board in the Eastern part of the state, they probably have a challenge on their hands if they have folks representing the coal industry filling business representative seats on their board. Uh, again, an extreme example, but hopefully it, it makes, makes the point. Of the 51% that represent business on your board, two of those seats must be filled by small business. Um, and then finally, um, the members, um, the people who get appointed to be members on the board, they have to go, they have to come through to you through a nomination process and they have to be nominated by local business organizations and or, tr or trade associations. And so local business organizations generally across the country has been chambers of commerce um, and groups like that. So um, it, it's, not, um, it's not okay that um, your neighbor just retired and he really wants to give back to his community and so he gets appointed to the local workforce development board. Um, first of all, um, he's retired and so therefore he's not employed and so he couldn't represent the business community. Um, and second, it would have, his nomination would have to go through um, this process, uh, being nominated by a local business organization or trade association. 
So um, all of those requirements really aren't that different from the, the law that was prior to WIOA, but I think they're a little more um, clear and, and defined, if you will. Can't go to the next one. So then the next category of membership on the board is what is called workforce representatives. And if you're familiar with the makeup of a local workforce board right now, um, and there are labor representatives on the board, they come out of this category. Now, this isn't entirely, um, this isn't just labor representatives, but that's just, uh, this is the category where, where they fit. So your workforce representatives must be 20% of the board. They must include representatives of labor organizations nominated by local labor federations or other representatives of employees. And then additionally, you must include a member of a labor organization or a training director from an apprenticeship program. And I know that um, all across Iowa, you all have a number of registered apprenticeship programs. And um, if you don't immediately know who, who those are, you could get in touch with uh, someone with, uh, from IWD and we're gonna give you contact information for folks um, at the end of the webinar today. But they could um, help you get that information about uh, apprenticeship programs. Now, within this workforce category, this is the first time that we start seeing optional seats that you can add to the board. So the next two are Mays. You all can decide as um, chief elected officials if you want to do this. So it, within the workforce representatives category, you may include a member of a CBO, a community-based organization, that has expertise in working with veterans or individuals with disabilities. That's because those are um, target populations for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And you may include a member of an organization with expertise serving um, eligible youth. Um, and that means youth that are eligible for the youth program of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And so with those two first, category, first two categories of membership on the board, something to just draw your attention to is those two categories, business representatives and workforce, represent the dual customer base of the public workforce system. So what does that mean? The public workforce system needs to serve two, uh, two customers. One, the employer slash business community. They, they, are, they are truly the ultimate customer because they're the ones who hire folks who would come out of the system. So that's one customer and they are represented by being 51% of the board. The second customer is the workforce category that we just went over. So this is intended to represent job seekers and employees who may be looking to um, upskill and upgrade um, so that they can you know, move into a, a different job and, and you know, get on a career path or, and climb a career ladder and those sorts of things. So we can go to the next slide. Um, the third category of representation on the local board that you all as elected officials will appoint are employment training representatives. Um, you must on the board include a representative of adult education. And so adult education is going to be those programs um, in your local area where um, an adult would go to pursue a GED or a high school equivalency or the, where they would go to access um, English as a second, second language services, um, that, that is your adult education. It's my understanding that in the state of Iowa, um, the adult education providers are um, community colleges. And so, um, this is a seat that would be filled by one um, a, a representative of adult education. Now, um, the other thing to that is um, you, the, the law requires that you have one adult education seat. You may have multiple providers of adult education in your local area you um, are not required to have 
all of those providers of adult education sitting on your board. Um, this is not a seat that represents the provider of service. They represent the concept and the service itself of adult education. So all of that means is if you've got multiple providers of adult education, um, as elected officials, you all can certainly choose to add all of those adult providers of education. Let's say you had three community colleges in your area and they were all three uh, providing adult ed. You can certainly add them. You have to then go back and add folks on the uh, business side and on the workforce side. Um, that's certainly a solution or an option. The other option though, the, and the option that we tend to see across the country is that um, adult education has the one seat and those multiple uh, the adult education providers just work together to communicate and the person who sits on the board communicates with their uh, colleagues and their peers on issues that they would need to communicate with them with. And so they're representing the service of adult education. So the next uh, category in employment training, no, let's go back. The next category, or the next uh, must, um, I'm sorry, is uh, you must include a representative from higher education providing workforce investment activities, including community colleges. Um, so this is going to be, um, this is where a lot of, across the country, a lot of the seats are filled by community colleges, but they could certainly be filled by um, a proprietary school um, that provides uh, workforce investment activities. And so that's really workforce focused training um, is, is what that could be. Um, and then within this category um, is a may, and you may include representatives of local education agencies and community-based organizations um, serving individuals with barriers to employment. So if that sounds familiar, that was also uh, located in the workforce representatives category. Um, it could be, that person could feel um, a slot in either, either category. Um, so that concludes the employment and training representatives. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to, to type in uh, your questions in the chat. And we're almost at the end of this section, and so we'll be able to, to talk through these. Um, one thing that came up, I, I will add this, one thing that came up in the training uh, that we did whenever we would get to this section is um, if you've got community colleges providing adult education services, and then you've also got a seat on the board that is almost always filled by community colleges, is it wrong to have two people from community colleges on the board? Um, the short answer to that is no, it's not wrong to do that. The person who is representing adult education truly needs to be representing adult education. Uh, regardless of who um, uh, her or his employer of record is. And so, um, uh, yeah, so we can, if there's any more questions about that, let us know and, and we, can, we can address them. But that was a question we got, I think, um, all six places we, we did the face-to-face -face training. So let's go on to the next slide and we're on our final category of uh, membership categories on the local workforce board. So we have some musts and we have some mays. So you must include a member from economic and community development entities. You all know who those entities are um, in, your, in your area. And just like with the adult education scenario, you're going to have multiple folks in your local area who could meet this category. Um, you, uh, don't feel pressured to include multiple seats here. And you certainly do not want to include um, an economic development director from every county within your local area. Um, that would be overload and it would make your board be, be huge because then you'd have to go back and add on the uh, uh, business side too. So um, as with the adult ed, you know, a point one, you can certainly add a second if you wanted. Um, but then ask that they communicate with each other. Next, include a member of the State Employment Service under the Wagner-Pizer Act. That's your IWD folks um, 
that are on the call with us today, and then must include a representative from vocational rehabilitation. Um, additionally, in Iowa, whenever, um, whenever the U.S. Department of Education sends vocational rehabilitation money to the state of Iowa, it is split into two pots um, at, the, at the state level, one to the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, re vocational rehabilitation and then the other pot goes to the Department for the Blind. Um, a representative from either organization can fill this seat on the board. Um, both of those agencies will work with you uh, for you to determine who is the best representative. Um, again, you all could add a representative from both. That is your prerogative. But again, and I'm going to beat this drum continually, um, just be mindful of your business representation requirement if you add, add another seat on the gover government rep side. And then lastly, you may include member, uh, a member from agencies running transportation, housing, public assistance programs. Those are generally going to be your um, community action agencies and, and, and things like that. And you may include a member from philanthropic organizations. Um, so that wraps up the four categories. Um, here is a time where um, not in the federal law, but in Iowa code, you all have got some Iowa specific things that as elected officials, you all need to be mindful of. If you take your board, and let's say you did the minimum board and board amount, and so you ended up with 17. Um, you, to meet this Iowa code requirement, you would pull out the Wagner Pizer Act seat, which is IWD, and you would pull out your vocational rehabilitation seat. And so you'd be down to 15. Um, those must be balanced by gender and political affiliation. So, um, so there's that. And I know that uh, we got a lot of comments, um, both for and against this, whenever we were doing the training. Um, but um, it, it's a requirement that, um, that you all do have with these boards. So I think we can go to the next slide, because I think we're at the conclusion here of that section. So just like before, we've got a polling question, and we want to do the polling question and then we can address any questions that have come through the chat. And then we will uh, open up the lines to see if anybody on the call um, has any questions. So the polling question, what membership category on the local workforce board must have the most people? Is it government, is it business, or is it workforce? And we talked about adding in Jeopardy music at this point, but uh, we're, we're, we're not going to do that to you. <laughs> I could sing, Lori, if you want. You could. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one wants that. <laughs> so have we had any questions come through the chat? Um, no, I have not seen any. Okay. So if we could, let's unmute and any of our, any of our folks who have called in and don't have access to the chat, do you all have any questions that you would like to ask? So um, there is a question about asking um, potential members of the board their political affiliation. And yes, um, it is a requirement um, based in Iowa code. And so what um, IWD has, has done is there are some forms that the chief lead elected official would submit to IWD around folks that are nominated. 
um, or appointed folks that are appointed to the board and it would be documented on one of those forms someone's political affiliation yes all right so um, in the interest of time having not heard any questions um, come through the line and not seeing any more coming through the chat let's just go ahead and move to the next section and again any questions that come up feel free to ask them in the chat at any time it doesn't have to just be over the section that we're covering um, and then at the very end of the webinar today we will um, open up the lines also for questions so the next section that we're going to talk about and the next key role of um, the chief elected officials is around the idea of a fiscal agent. Um, in the CEO guide, we are on page 20. Um, <clears throat> so from the law, from the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, it says that the CLEO, the chief lead elected official, may designate an entity to serve as the local fiscal agent. So let's, let's go back, I mean, not literally go back on this, slides, but just um, in, in thought, let's go back to um, that organizational chart that we uh, that Lynn went over uh, right around the time Stacy right before Stacy talked about um, about her slides. Um, the organizational chart starts at the federal level with the US Department of Labor, and they um, they send money to um, to the governor, to the state of Iowa, and it goes to IWD. In that regard, IWD is the is called the grant recipient. IWD then is to send the money to the local level, and the chief lead elected official um, in each of the um, Hold on just one second. Um, the, the, I'm sorry, I, something popped up on my screen. Um, the chief lead elected official is the grant subrecipient. So this, this is the part that Stacy was talking about that hasn't, has not been happening in the way that it should in Iowa. So to, what has to happen is that IWD issues the funds at the local level and they go to the chief lead elected official in each of the local workforce development areas. And the chief lead elected official, according to the law, serves as the fiscal agent. However, the chief lead elected official has the ability to designate another entity to be the fiscal agent. And so that's what this section is about. If, um, if the chief lead elected official representing all of the elected officials, the, the, the chief lead is not going to make this decision on her own or his own. But if that person does not designate a fiscal agent, that responsibility lies with the, the chief leads unit of government. Um, now, in designating a fiscal agent, it does not remove the chief elected officials liability for misuse of grant funds. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. And I'm sure that you've all heard uh, bits and pieces about that. And, and we're going to talk about it. But the law says that the elected officials within a local workforce development area have responsibility, ultimate responsibility for, for those dollars. And should there be um, misspending, um, should there be a finding, should there, whatever causes it, should there be a need for funds to be repaid to IWD or even to the US Department of Labor, if the entity or the contractor that misspent the funds does not have the ability to pay those funds back, that responsibility falls to the uh, chief elected officials in the local area. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that I think is important 
for purposes of the conversation around the fiscal agent. So the chief lead may designate a fiscal agent, but in doing so, that does not remove any of that liability stuff that we just talked about. So can we mute the lines, please? So uh, again, if no organization is designated, the chief leads um, unit of government shall fulfill that role. Um, the other thing about this is um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act um, in a variety of places talks about the need for there to be firewalls established to ensure that, um, to ensure accountability and transparency. And so um, in alignment with that and in support of that, the um, Iowa State Workforce Development Board has issued a policy that says um, the organization or entity designated to serve as a fiscal agent in a local workforce development area may not serve in any other selected or designated role within the local workforce system. So what that means is um, there are generally four roles that um, are either designated or selected to happen at the local um, workforce level. Those are um, fiscal agent, staff to the board, um, one-stop operator, and service provider. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those throughout today. So this policy is saying that um, if a chief lead elected official designates a fiscal agent, the entity that is selected to be fiscal agent cannot serve in any of those other three roles. So they could not be staff to the board, they could not be the one-stop operator, and they could not be selected to be a service provider. Um, right now across Iowa, you all do have entities and organizations, both community colleges and COGS or councils of government that are serving in multiple roles like we just described. And so moving forward, in a um, compliant system, that, that won't be able to happen anymore. All right, so um, if there's any questions about that, um, I know that that is um, a lot of information and I know that that, is, that portion represents a significant change in moving Iowa toward compliance and so if you, uh, if you need to ask questions about that, if you need to sit with that for a little bit before you come to your questions, that's totally fine. Um, so um, per usual, we have a polling question that we wanna ask and then we'll um, take any questions that have come through the chat. So the question is, who designates the fiscal agent? Is it IWD? Is it the current fiscal agent? Or is it the chief elected officials? All right. <clears throat> so you all can see those who answered the question, um, everybody answered it correctly. It is the chief elected officials who designate the fiscal agent. It is not IWD and uh, it is not the current fiscal agent. So it is the, it is the locals or it is the chief elected at the local level. All right. So I don't see any questions that have come through the chat. Um, um, Rhiannon, let's open the lines to see if any of our folks who have called in have any questions about that. And I, again, I always feel like a radio DJ saying, let's go to the lines and see if there's any callers. All right. So um, don't worry, um, 
it's fine if you're not asking questions or it's fine if you need to think about it. Uh, we just want to give you as many opportunities as we can um, to process this information and, and make it work for you in your local area. So we're just gonna go on to the next slide. All right, so we kind of already talked about this um, with um, the fiscal agent section, but in your guide, we're on page 34. Um, this is a section of the um, uh, agreement that you all will um, complete as elected officials. So uh, this is really uh, at the heart of what we just talked about with the fiscal agent stuff. So um, you all as elected officials will decide, should there ever be a circumstance where um, funds need to be repaid? And, and you know, it, it happens, you all. It, it, it's, not that, it, it's not that it happens constantly or that there's a chronic problem, but there, there are times when repayment of funds is necessary. Um, I'm sure Lynn and Rhiannon, um, and I'm sure Stacy has definitely seen it, and I know I've seen it across the country too. So in order to just be prepared for that, should that happen, you all as a local elected officials will outline how you all will share in that cost. Um, the, uh, and just so you know, the law says, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act says that the, it's the chief lead elected official that has liability for the funds, but then it also goes on to say that with the governor's approval, the chief lead elected official may share that liability with the other elected officials in the local area. And so Governor Reynolds, uh, of course, agrees with that. And so that's why this process is looking the way it is for, um, from IWD, is they're wanting that to, to be shared uh, should that situation ever arise, arise. So you all at the chief elected official level, you all are going to decide how you're going to share and share the burden, share the liability um, should uh, money ever have to be repaid. There is, uh, it's important that there is consensus on this issue, um, obviously, and um, this is not a situation where IWD is going to tell you what to do. You all, uh, you all know how to do this work and you all know, um, you all know about, about this stuff because you are elected folks. So you all decide what it needs to look like at the local level. Um, some possible methods for apportioning costs is you could, um, you know, if you have a, a, a 25 county local area, you could just take the, the amount of funds that have to be repaid, divide it by 25 and everybody pays the same. That is, that is an option, that's a very common option. Um, you could also do one based on population so that the more populated counties who in theory would have more, uh, more revenue, would uh, share more uh, of the financial burden. Uh, you could also do it uh, based on uh, the percentage of WIOA funds that have been expended um, based on a per county um, model. Like if funds are expended on a per participant level, you could do a scenario where, you know, you, you see which counties have received um, a greater benefit, so to speak, of the WIOA funds, and that benefit would be because of participants in the county that have accessed those funds. So Y'all could do that. Um, it's really whatever works for you, um, but uh, it has to be shared, and of course, it has to be agreed upon. You all are going to outline that. Um, you all are going to outline that in your 28E agreement, and um, it's going to be spelled out. And so um, IWD is going to, of course, review the agreement to make sure that you all have um, addressed each issue that needs to be addressed, but they're not going to be reviewing it to say, oh, well, we don't like what this looks like, Shelby County. You know, they're not going to be doing that. So we can go to the next slide. The other thing that you're going to do, and this uh, goes right along with that, um, and you're going to outline this in your 28E agreement as well, is um, 
at the local level, there are going to be, you're, uh, there are now, but you're going to competitively procure service providers who, who do work um, on behalf of the local workforce development board. And um, um, if you all are going to build, you all are going to put in your agreement, your shared liability agreement, what is the process for um, getting back money or recouping dollars that those, um, those providers may have misspent? So um, liability for costs, which are recommended for disallowance, um, rest with the entity responsible for incurring the cost. So if you have a contract with XYZ, agency and XYZ agency is the one who misspends funds, then you want to have a mechanism to first require XYZ agency do the repayment. And so you all are going to outline what process you all will use, what methods you will use as elected officials to um, recoup those dollars before you have to invoke the process that says your county governments have to repay. And so again, there's no right or wrong here, but you want to be thorough and, and um, that sort of stuff. So you're going to outline that here um, in your shared um, liability agreement, your 28E agreement. So next slide. Okay, we are um, not going to ask, we had a polling question, but um, I realized too late that the way it was worded was not um, not the best. So we're not going to ask the polling question because uh, I don't want to confuse anybody. So we'll just pause for a second and see if there's any uh, questions. I don't see any questions that have come in from the chat. Um, how about we do this? Since we've not had questions come over the lines, how about we just go on to the next section and then we'll stop then. And then if you have questions, uh, regardless of the section that they've come from, we'll just pause at the next question slide and open up the phone lines at that point. looking in your guide, um, it's on page 22. Um, one thing I want to mention, if you recall at the very beginning of this section, uh, we were talk, I had up the graphic that showed the CEOs, uh, chief elected officials and chief lead elected officials. And then there was the arrow down to the local workforce development board. And I talked about how those two groups are two separate groups. They have two sets of distinct responsibilities However, there were also some responsibilities that are shared between the two. What we're getting ready to talk about right now, which is the selection of the one-stop operator, is one of those duties that is shared between uh, the two groups. Whenever we say shared, it means that you all will fulfill this role and this responsibility or this task together. You won't, um, the local board won't do uh, do it and then you all do it. You all will do it, do it together and arrive at one at one answer together. So, so um, the one stop operator, let's let's stop for just a second and um, make sure that that even the selection of that is even clear. So um, Iowa Works is the uh, name of the workforce system in Iowa. You all may know the Iowa Works Office as an IWD office. You may know it as an unemployment office, and we all cringe at that, but I can tell you that that happens across the country. Here in Kentucky, we call our career centers unemployment offices too and, and stuff. But anyway, you, you know the entity and the, the, the facility that I'm talking about. So because if you recall when Lynn was talking early on, there are different programs or partner agencies as we like to call that come together literally under the same roof that make up 
Iowa works. They make up that one stop, op, uh, that one stop office or that one stop system. Um, and because of that, the law requires, um, and whenever I say law, again, I mean the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, requires that there be a neutral entity that operates as what is called the one-stop operator. And their role is to coordinate all of the services and things that happen out of those Iowa Works offices where multiple agencies are co-located um, to ensure that things are happening, one, as they should, to ensure that those partner agencies are integrating their services um, so that whenever a job seeker walks in a door um, of one of those offices, whoever they talk to, uh, doesn't matter who the staff person works for, that that customer can get the service that they need. And so the law requires that there be this neutral entity that serves as that coordinating body, and it is known as a one-stop operator. Uh, you can see on the slide, tip generally the role that a one-stop operator plays. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, now, the law requires that the selection of that one-stop operator be competitively procured. In other words, it has to go out for bid and um, entities have to bid on the work. And then you as elected officials in conjunction with the local workforce development board will select who is the best entity to serve as the one-stop operator. If you recall, whenever we were talking about the fiscal agent, we said that there are four roles that happen at the local level that are either selected or designated. And in that regard, we were saying that if an entity or the entity selected to be the fiscal agent, they can't serve in any other capacity. Those four roles are fiscal agent, staff to the board, one-stop operator, and service provider. So the entity that is selected to be fiscal agent cannot be the one-stop operator. Um, so the one-stop operator, um, can be also be the entity that serves as a service provider, but they, they couldn't be the fiscal agent and they couldn't serve as staff to the board. Right now across Iowa, what is happening is um, you all don't have um, one-stop operators. You have entities um, that have stepped up and filled in the gap to do some of the work of the one-stop operator, but this is one of those things um, that's, a, that's a compliance issue. Um, so even it's good that entities have stepped up to fulfill this role and, and, and it's good that entities have worked together to fulfill this role, but the law requires a competitive procurement around it. And so this is something that once, um, once there's a decision made on what the local area structure is gonna look like in Iowa and fiscal agents are designated and um, local workforce boards are appointed, this is one of those things that will happen after all of that. So um, in terms of a timeline, the selection of the one-stop operator is not going to be one of the first things that you all as chief elected officials do but it is going to be one of the key pieces that you do that helps to bring the system into compliance. And as of right now, based on the timeline that has been developed, and again, recalling what I said earlier, we know that the appeals process um, has a significant impact on the timeline, but right now, um, based on the timeline that IWD has put together, the one-stop operator would have been competitively procured and selected and that one-stop operator would be in place ready to perform services effective december 1st 2020 so 
a little over um, 12 months away. So we can go to the next slide. So we'll stop here. I think there is a polling question here. Um, and uh, so the polling question, if an entity serves as the one-stop operator, can that same entity also serve as the fiscal agent to the local workforce development board? And so this is a yes or a no. And then um, if we wanna open up the phone lines, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So do we have any questions uh, that anybody would want to ask um, over the phone? Man, you all are silent. That's all right though, that's all right. I know you all are taking it all in. All right. So let's go. Lori, yes. Loris has a question. I'm wondering if we can unmute her so she can ask it. Sure, of course. Thanks for, thanks for seeing that. Loris, go ahead. Oh, it's not. Okay. Well, if you want to just type it in, we'll, uh, we'll get it answered. Or we'll try to get it answered. While Loris is doing that, does anybody else have a question they want to ask? I'll take questions about Kentucky basketball. I'll take questions about Kentucky bourbon. I'll take any question you all want to ask. I won't answer <laughs> questions about Iowa football, though. I don't know anything about it. Lori, it looks like the questions come through the chat. Okay. Uh, it says, our current region has formed a, I think it's foundation to serve as fiscal agent. Is that okay? Um, without any additional information, I would say um, the short answer would be yes. Um, you would need to ensure that that foundation can receive money um, and can track dollars the way that federal dollars have to be tracked and they can do the reporting um, and those sorts of things. So I think, um, um, yeah, that would be my answer. And, and if you want to add, Loris, if you want to add any more detail to that to maybe um, feel free, but in short, if they can fulfill the role, um, uh, then then yes, and then IWD has issued um, a policy around the roles of the fiscal agent. And um, Michelle, would you mind looking up what that policy number is and putting it in the chat just so um, Lars can have that so that they can reference that um, in evaluating if, if that's an appropriate fiscal agent? Yes, I will. Oh, it was set up specifically to respond to the transformation. Awesome. Um, that's great. I mean, I think in short, I think it should be fine, but you, you want to make sure that, that that entity has the ability to receive, to receive funds and report on them and track them and, and those sorts of things. So, um, yep. All right, any other questions? We've got one more section that we want to cover. And then uh, we will wrap up for the day and, and or begin to wrap up and talk about next steps and those sorts of things. So the last thing that we want to talk about is creating the initial bylaws of the local workforce development board. Um, if you remember, um, you know, I talked about early on just the distinction um, and, and I made the statement that the local workforce development board works for you. And, and, and that made, I don't think that's the wrong thing to say. That may just be a new way that, uh, that people have talked about the relationship between the chief elected officials and a local workforce development board. But, um, but at the end of the day, you all have financial liability for the funds. And so I think that that puts your role in a very different role than the local workforce development board. So 
The uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act says that the um, local elected officials or chief elected officials um, have the responsibility to create the initial bylaws of the local workforce development board. Um, we've listed a few things here. I didn't list everything, but a few of the key topics that you all want to uh, have in your bylaws. Um, and this actually comes out of a policy that IWD has issued. They don't tell you how to do this. They just tell you that these are the key things that you all need to, to have in bylaws. Um, but you're gonna want to look, as you're looking at um, board membership, you're gonna wanna look at the nomination process and, and outline that. You're gonna wanna look at term limits. And uh, since these are, since these will be new boards, um, even though there are existing local workforce boards uh, with a new local area configuration, they will be established as new boards. And so uh, you will need to stagger um, board membership because everybody is starting new and fresh. Um, and so you're gonna wanna stagger that and you all will determine what that is. Um, you know, how are you all going to respond to vacancies and um, that sorts of thing. Um, you'll want to consider, can the local workforce development board um, have proxies or alternates? Um, and what does that need to look like? Um, one strategy that uh, we've seen play out across the country with some, um, with some bylaws is that, um, of course, uh, it's allowable that um, a board member send a proxy, but there's also um, attendance requirements added into the bylaws. And that if a local workforce board member misses, um, you know, three board meetings in a row, and I'm just, don't take three as the magic number, I'm just pulling it out of the air that then, you know, they're, um, they're removed, they, that they're removed from the board. Um, you know, things come up and, and we understand that and especially when you're talking about chief executives from key businesses, you know, they, they have busy lives and the point isn't to make them pick the workforce board over, you know, what's happening at the plant that day. But the point is, um, if somebody makes a commitment to be on the board, you want them to make that commitment and all the, and keep that commitment. And, and while things happen, and things come up, um, there should be allowances for, for, for things that happen. But sometimes we can determine a person's commitment um, based on their attendance. And so building in robust, um, enforceable attendance requirements, also around the issue of proxies. Um, if I'm the CEO of the local hospital and I designate a proxy, it still here this is just a best practice it still needs to be a person from the hospital who has policy making authority or hiring authority i can't designate a proxy who um, doesn't uh, who, who is the administrative assistant at the hospital in other words again that's not a requirement that's just something we've seen um, in in some bylaws also, and, and you know, today's a great example, how do you, what are the limits of using technology such as phone and web-based meetings? You know, one of the things we heard loud and clear when we made our um, tour of Iowa a couple of, a few weeks ago was, you know, the local areas, um, um, they, they, are, they are large. And, and for those local workforce board members to travel to attend meetings, you know, sometimes that can be a hindrance. And so being mindful of that, what can you all as chief elected officials put into the bylaws that, um, that allow, for, uh, allow for that? Um, and, you know, just thinking about those, those local workforce board members are, are working for you in terms of setting the vision and overseeing services in the local workforce system. And so how can you all um, um, make that happen in the best way possible? And so using technology for meetings is, is certainly, um, certainly something you all need to discuss and figure out what's gonna work best. 
And then a definition of a quorum. Um, you know, we know that that board meetings of various kinds um, sometimes have issues getting a quorum. And so you all would want to be very thoughtful about that and, and, um, and, and put that in there. Um, one thing that I will say that we've seen that again is a best practice is, you know, we talked a lot about um, the business representatives on the board and um, they of course have to be 51% as you all all got that, that polling question right. Um, and they have to be the largest, um, they are the largest membership category on the board. You should have more people at a board meeting that are representing business than any other group of people, be it um, um, member on the board or people sitting in the audience. And so one of the best practices that we've seen across the country is, um, and we did this in Kentucky, is we um, made a, um, a super majority um, requirement. So whenever there was going to be key decisions made, um, you, could, you couldn't um, take a vote unless business was truly the most represented um, membership category in attendance that day. Um, and so I was at a state level uh, in Kentucky with our workforce system and we made that requirement and our local, our local workforce boards, um, they, they challenged it at first, but then they adjusted to it because they, they, they liked the idea that it was really putting some teeth behind this idea that uh, local business is truly leading the efforts on the local system and, and people felt like that it was um, a reflection of what was in the law. So anyway, just some ideas you don't in any way or shape or form have to do those, but just things to things to think about. So with that, um, that is the final slide around um, chief elected official roles and responsibilities. So I think we have um, a final polling question. And so let's pull that up. So true or false, the local workforce development board will develop their own bylaws and the chief elected officials will approve the bylaws. So just give us a yes or no on that one. And then um, I see some activity in the chat. I think, um, um, okay, so have there been any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Um, we'll give you all a second to, to answer that polling question. So the, the local workforce development, the person who develops the bylaws or the entity who develops the bylaws is the chief elected officials. You all that are on the call, you all who did training with us in from Osceola to Storm Lake to Muscatine, you all as the chief elected officials will develop the initial bylaws of the board. Um, and then you all will give those to the local workforce board you all are not the local workforce board. You all are a separate group. So, um, so I think we can close that poll and then, um, everybody and, um, what, um, what questions do you all have? I don't see any questions in the chat, Lori. Okay. Well, um, Rhiannon, if you want to go on to that next slide. So um, who's, who can help? So for the six local workforce areas, as, as the state board voted them uh, on them back in February, these are the, the six um, and the counties that are listed. There's also an IWD contact person listed. And um, if you have any questions based on your county, um, you can contact Ron A, 
Mike or Linda, and their emails are located there. And they can help you. Um, they, they have been working quite a bit with the elected officials across the state. And um, they, they are able to answer your questions and they're able to consult with us and we can help answer questions uh, for them and they can get back to you. So they're there to assist you as you all as elected officials work through this process. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to Lynn and we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, all right, well, um, you'll see a contact slide in front of you. Um, this is a WIOA governance inbox where you can post questions um, and that go directly to IWD, um, as well as you can reach out directly to Michelle, who is on the line today. This is her email address. Um, Michelle, do you have anything you want to add around folks reaching out, contacting you? No, I, the only thing that I would add is, you know, absolutely, if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or Mike, Linda, Rane. You know, IWD through this process, we understand that this is a seismic shift from what everybody is used to doing and that you need our support to be able to make this happen. And we're dedicated to doing that. Um, you know, this training even, for example, this is not the only time we're going to be offering the training. We can, we know that um, continuing education is going to be very important. So we're working with the Iowa State Association of Counties to be able to um, come to some of their meetings and provide continuing education and communicate information. So, um, you know, the, the stronger the communication there is between um, us and you, the CEOs, the better this uh, will be and the, and the more impact we'll have. So please reach out if you have any questions. Great. And thank you for attending. Yes. And uh, I want to say thank you as well on behalf of Lori and Rhiannon and myself. I know this was a long morning, but we do really appreciate your attendance and your engagement. Um, just want to let you know that uh, there will be an email that goes out um, uh, in the next few days that will have the link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, as well as a link to a survey, online survey evaluation you can do to evaluate today's webinar. Um, and with that, I just want to say thanks to everyone and um, look forward, hopefully, to talking with you again as we move forward with the system transformation. So have a great day.